having a champagne and coffee party today in honor of the Queen of Sheba today of the French Chef. Hi everybody and welcome to my apartment. Um, today what we're going to be doing is I'm going to show you how to make the Ren de Shaba, um, also called as the Queen of Sheba. It's a really lovely cake from the one and only Miss Julia Childs, the master in the art of French cooking, the holy grail of any cook's repertoire if you're into cooking. So this cake is a really nice cake. It's one layer. It is not really a rich cake like you would find for a birthday cake, for example. It doesn't have that really fluffy, buttery icing. It doesn't have um, all of the layers, but it's still very dense and gooey, and it all comes together at the very end, and it's just delightful. The great thing about it is that it uses the ingredients that you can easily find here at home. So let's get started. For the tools that you're going to need for this cake, um, it's pretty simple. You're going to need a round cake pan, um, about eight, 8 inches in diameter and about an inch and a half deep. Uh, you're going to need a cooling rack for your cake, obviously. You're going to need some measuring tools. You are going to need a rubber spatula. You're going to need a wooden spoon. You're also going to need a some method of mixing. You can either do it by hand with a wooden spoon is fine. If you do that, you're going to need a big bowl to mix all of your ingredients in, about um, three quarts. Um, if you have a hand beater, you can use that. In 1961 is when this book was published. They did have stand mixers back then. Um, it's a really nice convenience. I think that it mixes things a lot better. We will be whipping egg whites, and so it's definitely a good idea to use some sort of electric mixer. If you are going to use your electric mixer, you will need two different attachments. You're going to need the paddle attachment to do the creaming of the butter, and then you will be needing your balloon whisk to whisk the egg whites, because you're going to make them nice and foamy um, until nice, beautiful peaks form in those egg whites. Okay, and then for your ingredients, what you're going to need is... You're going to need four ounces of baking chocolate, semi-sweet. You can use morsels or you can use bar. Um, it's pre-measured for you. I like the bar because I don't have a kitchen skill yet, so you can just, you don't have to worry about measuring out. You can use morsels, just be sure to measure them. You're going to need either two tablespoons of rum or you're going to use coffee. I'm going to go ahead and use coffee. Um, be mindful because we will be putting this on the stove and melting it down with the chocolate. So I just use a really nice medium house blend roast, nothing too dark. Um, I think that if you probably use a darker roast and melt this down with the chocolate, it's going to be a little burnt tasting. So just be, be aware of that. You will need, um, you'll need a, one stick of butter. Unsalted is always the best to use for baking purposes. You're going to need some granulated white sugar. You're going to need three eggs. They will be separated for the yolks and the whites, so we will be doing that. You're going to need a little bit of salt, um, some almonds. Now the book says pulverized almonds. You can buy whole almonds and then put them in the food processor. I just went and bought sliced almonds and you can crumble them up as needed. You're going to need some pure almond extract and then you're going to need some cake flour. If you don't have cake flour, that's okay. What you can do is just, um, the recipe calls for half a cup, so what you're going to do is just take two tablespoons out of that, and um, that should be just as, it, it'll give you the same density as cake flour, or you can just sift it a couple of times and just make it really nice and fine, that's okay too. Okay, so let's get started. So first what you're going to want to do, make sure that your Oven is preheated to 350 degrees. When you're baking, you never want to put something in the oven before it's preheated because it's not going to cook thoroughly. Um, it's just not going to turn out the way it's supposed to. So definitely make sure you put aside time to do that. Cream the butter. So you're going to use a fourth of a cup of butter that's nice and soft, along with two thirds of a cup of granulated sugar. And like I said, if you want to use the method to just mix this by hand, definitely it's totally fine. It will give you the same result. It just requires 
a little bit more work. So, I'm gonna put my paddle attachment on. Normally if you use an electric mixer, you don't want to put it on full blast at first whenever you're creaming together a batter. I like to put it on two and kind of let it work in. And we're going to let this mix for about two or so minutes just until it's nice creamy. You might have to scrape the edges with a spatula, that's okay. Okay. Just going to go ahead and scrape the edges around here. That's nice and clean for us. Beautiful. Okay, so now what we're going to go do is head on over to the stove and we're going to melt down our chocolate. You're just going to want to put the burner on a really, just kind of a medium setting is fine. Um, you don't want to scorch it. So I'm just going to put it about right there. It looks good. Right here I have two tablespoons of coffee. Just a medium house blend. So what we're going to do is pour that on in there. And then place in just these little, they're one ounce chocolate baking bars, and they're going to melt right on down. So after mixing it down only for about two or so minutes, we have this really nice, beautiful consistency. We have our chocolate all melted. It's time to start putting everything together. So what I did is just brought it over. It's a really nice melted chocolate. It smells really nice with the coffee. So we're going to leave that be for a while, and we're going to come back to it. It's time to separate the eggs, the yolk from the white. Now, there's a couple different methods to do this. I'm pretty old school with it. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to have two bowls, and then you're going to want something to throw it in. The, um, the shells, I'm just going to throw it in this bowl here. Back it over, and you're gonna, this is going to be the bowl for the whites. Now, you want to keep the yolk in the egg. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your hand over the one that has the yolk in it, and you're just going to very slowly, very gently let all of the whites run into the bowl with the whites. So when it's unable to start coming out, you're going to very, very slowly and very carefully keep the one side of the shell in your hand and transfer that liquid from one shell to the other. So then we have some more white coming out. And you're just going to keep doing that until, don't try not to let the yolk break because then you'll have a mess. You're just going to keep doing that until there's really no more whites left. So that one's looking pretty good. So as you can see, we have both of the shells. You're just going to pour the yolk right in there. Now that we have our yolks separated from our white, what it's time to do is it's time to take the egg yolks, put them into here, and we're going to beat them until they're nice and well blended. Eggs are really, really great in recipes, and it's always important to use fresh eggs. Eggs act as a binding agent whenever you're cooking, so it just brings everything together. Great. Whenever your recipe calls for beating egg whites, it's very important that you start with a clean bowl, clean attachment, clean utensils, so your egg whites can puff up in the way that they're supposed to. If your bowl is wet or it has residue of butter, your, your eggs aren't going to form those really nice soft peaks. They're not going to become foamy, they're just going to fall flat. So it's very important if you are using a stand mixer to take your batter that was already in your bowl, Put it in a mixing bowl. Make sure you get your bowl nice and clean for your egg whites. Take your three egg whites and just a dash of salt, and you're going to put it in your bowl. This is where having a stand mixer or some sort of electric mixer comes in handy. If not, there are techniques to whisk them. You will need a whisk, um, a wire whisk, and lots of patience. But I would say having a stand mixer is a nice investment. So just a little bit of salt. You don't really have to measure that out. And then what you're going to want to do is put this very, very high speed. So I'm going to crank it up to about 6 and then we'll increase it if we need to. Okay, so you're going to beat it until soft peaks are formed. And what a soft peak is, is whenever you take a fork or you take your whisk, and you just run it through very softly and put it in, there's a nice little billow at the top. So we have that. It take a tablespoon of granulated white sugar. You're going to put that in with your egg whites so it's almost going to make kind of a meringue. And you are just going to put that back and beat it some more and there's just going to be those nice white peaks. 
I actually put this on 10 to get those nice peaks. Beautiful. With a rubber spatula, you're going to take the chocolate, melted chocolate, and put it in. It should be pretty cool by now, so it should be okay with the egg yolks. You're going to put that in with your sugar butter mixture. So, I'm going to just spoon this in. The problem is if you put liquid, melted chocolate, hot milk, anything in with an egg mixture, it cooks the egg. Blend this all up really nicely with your rubber spatula. A wooden spoon would also probably be fine. What I do is just kind of fold the ingredients and what you do with that is you scrape the side of the bowl and then very gently fold it over itself. You're not very aggressively stirring it, you're just kind of blending it. This is a little bit more time consuming. It's very important that you do it with egg whites, yolks not so much. Your end result with this should be a very nice, um, kind of grainy because of the sugar, it's just a very nice light brown chocolatey mixture with the, with the almost with like an icing consistency. So after that's all mixed, what you're going to do is you're going to take a fourth of the egg whites put them into here. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. It's important to fold. If you do not fold your egg whites, they are going to fall flat. Your batter will not have the consistency it's supposed to. Um, this makes it very nice and airy. So again, the folding technique is you scrape the bottom, the sides, and you just fold it over itself so gently. It's going to look like nothing's happening, and you might get frustrated, but I promise it is doing its job. It is more time consuming, but in the end it's always worth it. We have that folded pretty good. It's really important when you're using flour that you don't do a heaping mound like this because it's not going to be correct. You're going to have either too much, it's going to be too dense, or it's not going to be enough flour. So always just kind of make it settle and then take a knife and just scrape it. So it's perfectly even, not too much, just enough. That's much better. And adding the flour and the egg whites is you're going to alternate. And you always try to make sure that you end with the dry ingredients, so the flour. Take about a third of the flour. So again, I don't measure out exactly a third, I just kind of eyeball it, just shake it in pretty slowly, fold the flour in, just like you did with those egg whites. And after that, we're going to alternate with some more egg whites and then again some more flour until we're out of um, until we're out of both of them. It's starting to look really nice, have that cake batter consistency. Not that I would ever doubt Julia Child. Julia was a very interesting person. She used the media, many media outlets really, to get her name out and really usher in the era of cooking on television. So you see shows like Paula Dean, Giada at Home, um, gosh, who else? Any any cooking show, really. Um, and she really ushered in that. She had a show called The French Chef that ran for many years. She had a show called Baking with Julia, which is still reruns are played on PBS, in which she brings in guest hosts such as Martha Stewart and Jacques Pepin. Um, she has her own show with Jacques, actually, or had her own show with Jacques. Um, he was a French chef and they would cook together. So she, she was a big fan of collaborative efforts, which is seen in her book as her first book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 1, has two other authors, Simone Beck and Louisette Bertolt. Her second one, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 2, just kind of expands the repertoire, and she worked on that with Simone Beck. She met Simone Beck in her time in France. Her husband, Paul Child, worked for the government, and they were stationed in France. She met Simone there um, to occupy her time. She took classes at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, fell in love with cooking, fell in love with Paris. Um, they moved around quite a bit. They lived in Germany, came back to the States, went back to Paris, but Julie's chi or Julie Child's heart was always in Paris. Um, she would write letters to Simone 
and they would uh, swap recipes and that's really how the book came to be. It was a lot of it was through correspondence, through snail mail. So there's definitely something to be admired about that in our era of instant communication with the internet and the telephone. We have one last step before we put this into the oven to bake. We're going to put in our almond extract and then the almonds. So we need to have a fourth of a tablespoon or a fourth of a teaspoon of almond extract. I like to use pure almond extract. They have imitation available. I think pure is always just the better option. And if you overshoot, that's okay. Just pour what you can back into the bottle or just go for it. As Julia Child said, this is my favorite quote of hers, with cooking you have to have the sort of what the hell attitude. Usually, you know, mistakes happen, it's okay. Finally what we have to do is add in a third of a cup of our almonds. If you have an almond allergy, that's okay, you can omit this. We're going to use the almonds for the decorating later on. Again, if you are allergic, you don't have to do that. If you don't like almonds that much, that's okay, you can skip it. Pour this straight on into the batter. Just fold it on in there until it's blended through pretty nicely. Now it's time to put all of your lovely batter into your cake pan. Make sure your cake pan is prepared properly. You're supposed to butter it and then flour it. So to butter it, I just take the wrapper of the butter that we use for the cooking and smear the open part of it in the pan. And then you're just going to take about a teaspoon of flour, maybe a little more or less, um, and knock it around in there. Make sure you get the sides. You don't want anything to stick. It's time to put this in your prepared cake pan. So you're just going to take it, pour it in there with your spatula. Make sure you get everything. It comes out very easily. It's very light. Once you have it all out of your bowl, just kind of smooth it out with your spatula. Make sure everything's nice and even. You don't want it to too thick in one area of the pan and not thick enough in the other as then it won't heat and cook properly. Make sure you get along those edges. And once it looks pretty even, go ahead and stick it in the oven, 350 degrees for about 25 minutes. Um, be sure to turn it and check on it, so we'll be right back once it's out. After you've let your cake bake for 25 minutes, um, you can check and make sure that it's done all of the way. I know every oven is a little finicky, but it's a good way to test to make sure it's done is if you insert a knife or a toothpick into the very center of the cake and it comes out clean, then your cake is done. If it's not, maybe go for a couple minutes, but definitely monitor it because it's very easy to overcook that way. So what came out is like this, just a nice cake, it's pulled away from the edges, it's got a little bit of a crater in the middle, but that's okay, we're not making a cheesecake here, and it's going to be covered with a delicious icing anyway. So you're going to let this stay in the pan for 10 minutes, and what you're going to do is you're going to take it out and you're going to flip it onto the cooling rack. And this is no easy feat for me, I know. Um, I usually end up having it upside down, but what we're going to do is we're going to set it on a oven mitt. We're going to put it like this and then we're going to have to excuse me, flip it again, but that's okay. So you're going to take it and as Julia Child would say, you have to have the courage of all of your convictions and you just flip it. So you're going to take it, make sure it's nice and secure between the pot and the, sh and the cooling rack and you're going to pray that it doesn't stick. So one, two, three. Alright, now don't yank the pan off of the cake, just kind of wiggle it and I can already tell it's going to stick a little bit. So that is when you're going to want to take a knife 
any butter knife will do. And you're just going to kind of go around the edge between the cake and the pan. And kind of break that connection between the two so that maybe your cake will come out a little easier. So, let's try that again. With the courage of your convictions. Alright, I think that might have been a little more promising. And there we have it. There we go. It's going to cool down for an hour. Do not ice it before it is cool. Your icing will run all over the place. I know this from experience. So let it cool for an hour. Be nice and patient. And then we're going to come back and we're going to ice this. The cake is looking really, really great. It's nice and smooth. Everything's kind of settled at the top. It's cool and it's nice and fudgy looking. So it's time to get it iced. And what you're going to need is just very few simple things. It's a glissage au chocolat icing, not a traditional buttercream. It doesn't have any powdered sugar in it. It does have butter. It is butter-based, but it's not as gritty. It's not like a buttercream that you would traditionally find in America. So what you're going to need is very simple. You need two ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. Again, you have a choice this time of rum or coffee. Just two tablespoons of brewed coffee is what I used. Again, medium house blend. I love Javalia. I think it has a really smooth flavor, so I love to use Javalia. You're going to need a small pan to melt your chocolate with your coffee. You're going to need a spoon to mix it, and then instead of using an electric mixer, we're going to beat the chocolate in a bowl of ice water. So a whole tray of ice cubes covered with water, and once you're done melting it, you're going to submerge everything in there with the chocolate and the coffee, beat in the butter so everything is nice and smooth. You're going to need five to six tablespoons of softened butter. You're going to add that one tablespoon at a time. You're going to need a wooden spoon, and you're going to need either a you're going to need either a knife, a butter knife. Um, an offset spatula, a rubber spatula. I like to use the back of a spoon to spread icing on the cake. I just think it's a lot easier that way. And if you want, you can use almonds to garnish. So let's get started. Use the same method to melt down your chocolate and your coffee. And now it's time to add the butter. So add it very gradually. So just a couple pieces at a time. It's easy if you melt the butter down. Don't try to put it in straight out of the fridge because it's just going to be kind of lumpy and messy. And again for this, unsalted butter works great. Beat that in there. The chocolate's still going to be pretty warm from the stove. Do not put it in the ice yet. We're going to do that after the butter is all melted. When you have everything all mixed down with the butter and the chocolate and the coffee, it's going to look more like a ganache, so that's why you're going to put it in the ice bath and just continue to whip it and stir it until it becomes a little bit cooler so that we can achieve that consistency in which we're going to ice the cake with. Keep mixing until you get this really nice fudgy looking type of frosting, you'll definitely know when it's done. So it's going to be runny at first and now it's just nice and stiff and it's kind of standing up on its own. And definitely if we spread it, it's not just going to be running all over the place. So now the fun part begins and it's time to ice the cake. And again, you can use whatever method of decorating that you like. If you use an offset spatula, that's fine. You could use a rubber spatula. If you even wanted to pipe some details on here, that is totally up to you. Cake decorating kind of gives you freedom to do whatever you'd like to do. I like to use the back of a spoon. This isn't really that formal of a cake. I mean, it depends on what occasion that you're serving it for. I think it's really pretty to just put some icing on and then maybe garnish it with a couple of almonds. I think that'd be really nice because the cake's going to taste amazing no matter how you decorate it.
And now you may garnish your cake with just a little bit of almonds. If you prefer, if you don't, that's okay too. I'm not going to get too finicky about it. I'm just going to kind of sprinkle some on the top. It'll just give it a nice crunch as well as the almonds baked inside. Don't forget about that. Just kind of sprinkle them evenly. However much looks good to you. And there we have our queen of Sheba cake. After baking our cake and icing it, we have a beautiful end result. It's a nice chocolatey fudge, really, really fudgy cake on the inside, very gooey consistency, but definitely it's done. Nice crunch inside with the almonds. I can't wait to try it. This cake looks really, really great on the table for any occasion, and it definitely pairs great with any kind of coffee. So let's give it a try. It's delicious. Certainly a cake that you as a cook should be proud of. Your guests will be proud of you and thankful that you made it. And certainly a cake that the queen herself, Julia Child, will be proud of you for doing too. You can check this out as well as tons of other recipes from the woman herself in this book. This is her first volume or you can check out all of her other ones. So enjoy. Happy cooking, happy reading, and as Julia Child would say, This is Julia Child. I'm Julia Child. I'm Julia Child. Bon appétit. Bon appétit.